It's good morning. Good to see you today. Thanks for being here at Grace. Man, we're so glad you're here. I want to welcome you, of course. Welcome everyone in the chapel behind us, everyone at Chaska, and a uh, huge hello to everyone watching online today. Uh, we are in Judges chapter 12, so if you've been gone for a while, yeah, we're still in this book, Judges chapter 12. You know what, uh, last week I, uh, I read an article from the uh, Las Vegas Sun that highlighted how, how dangerously divided America is, is right now. And, and a poll was conducted that said that 52% of people who voted for former President Trump were in favor of splitting the country into, into red states and, and blue states while 41% of voters who voted for President Biden also agreed with the idea. Let's, let's have a national divorce, if you will. And so the article went on to say, and I wanna read this to you here today. These results from this article paint a dispiriting picture about how Americans with different political opinions devalue each other, how little room they see for compromise, how faintly the population grasps the foundational ideal that strength lies in our unity. The philosophical implications of this are staggering, the article says. A large portion of Americans are ready to abandon the greatest democracy the world has ever known and cleave a nation that has endured periods of political chaos for two centuries and counting. Those crises included a civil war that yielded four years of horror and ended with 750,000 deaths. Now millions of Americans are pushing for a national divorce and more conflict. For this, the blame largely lies, the article says, largely lies with social media and extremist media and out of touch politicians. I, I added that part, I should have put that in, that was my addition. For inflaming the political differences between Americans, eroding trust in institutions and coarsening the level of public discourse. It's little wonder that some Americans see others as foolish when so many exist in information silos that feed their own worldview and characterize those who disagree with them as enemies to be destroyed. This feels like the state of America right now. It's really, really heavy stuff. And it feels to me like a pretty accurate portrayal of the way things are trending in, in our country today. Right, I mean, there are numerous conflicts raging right now, whether it be over masks, COVID responses, vaccine mandates, the economy, politics, uh, school curriculum, or social issues. You can just take your pick, and the stakes are high, and people are animated and heated and divided. Our country is literally being pulled apart at the seams. And, and I'm not sure a whole lot of people even care anymore. And so it raises the question for me then, like how does the church be the church in this environment? You ever wonder, like, like how does the church function like, behave like the church and navigate this sort of conflict and division and strife and hatefulness that we see in our workplaces, that we see even in our own families, certainly in our communities and in our country. Well, let's see what God's word has for us today. Judges 12, verses one to seven. Let's stand together in honor of God's word. I'm only gonna read seven verses because like all the previous chapters are like 88 verses. It's hard to stand for like an hour and a half and read 88 verses. So we'll read seven. Judges 12, one to seven. It says, the men of a frame were called to arms and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We'll burn your house over you with fire. Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Verse four. Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim and the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, you're fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. 
And the Gileadites, Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, are you an Ephraimite? When he said no, they said to him, then say Shibboleth, which means ear of corn. So what was going on here, they're, they're making them like perform a linguistics test. So it'd be like, if you're from the north, we want to hear how you say y'all. Or, like, if you're from the north, people don't say y'all, they say use guys. It's use guys. It's kind of like that. So you kind of give yourself up based on how you say y'all. If you don't say y'all, you're not from the south. If you say use guys, we know you're guilty. It's over for you. It's kind of that. So then say shibboleth, and he said sibboleth. He couldn't pronounce the S-H, for he couldn't pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan, and at that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in his city in Gilead. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And so I, I hope your minds are starting to draw all kinds of points of connection from this passage to our culture. I hope you start to see like how, how conflict arises. And then I look at this and go, how does, a, how does a simple conversation devolve into a conflict that eventually leads to the slaughter of 42,000 people in one day? So I wanna break this down. You kind of see some dynamics here around this, this idea of conflict and how conflict just takes off and leads to carnage. So if you look on your outlines here, number one, you'll see this. The first dynamic, I think, that initiated the conflict that led to carnage, 42,000 Ephraimites being slaughtered, was what I would call unchecked pride. So here again, like in chapter 8, the men of Ephraim reacted with an inflated sense of self-importance. They did the same thing to Jephthah that they did to Gideon in chapter 8. Why'd you forget us? We wanted to be a part of the glory. We wanted to get in on the victory parade. Why'd you leave us out? And so they came hard at Jephthah. Why didn't you call us to help in the battle? And so instead of like celebrating the victory over the Ammonites, they were offended that they didn't get recognized or lauded. And their, their thirst for glory, their unchecked pride, opened them up to the bait of offense, and they took the bait. So please hear me. At the core of all conflict, at any level, at the core of all conflict at any level is unchecked pride. It is the idolatrous desire to get what you want any way you want it. And so whenever like the top goal in life is to get glory for yourself or the top priority of every moment is to be applauded and celebrated and recognized, an ugly crash and burn is right around the corner. That's why, as God's people, we're always having to check ourselves. So let me just ask you this question. If you don't get your way, if you don't get your way or things don't go your way, do you have the humility to just move on without being offended, or does your pride cause you to take offense? That's always kind of a measuring stick for us. When I don't get my way or things don't go my way, can I just be humble enough to just kind of move on and just respond with grace and mercy? Or do I immediately get offended because my sense of pride says that I am entitled to something? I'm entitled to recognition or applause or whatever the case may be. The unchecked pride of the men of a frame caused them to actually create an issue where there should have been no issue. You're going to see that here in a moment. And I would say this, that's what pride does to us. Pride causes us to unnecessarily dig our heels in when we, when we don't need to. Like pride keeps the focus 
on us and not the big picture. Pride keeps the focus on our desires and not on God's will. And so it was that unchecked pride that began to leak out and create all kinds of issues for the Ephraimites. A second dynamic that initiated the conflict that led to carnage was accusatory questioning. Look at the second part of verse one. Notice the the tenor and the tone of this. Like, why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and you didn't call us to go with you? Why? Like, why? There's like tone in that. There's attitude behind that. And just for the record, okay, just for the record, why questions are not good lead-in questions. Why did you leave the towel on the bed? Can you hear the tone and the accusation behind that? Why did you leave the towel on the bed? Why are you always late? Why are you such a fill in the blank? So I'm gonna help every married couple here today. You need to like lay down the why questions and you need to pick up this phrase, okay? Help me understand. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Just help me understand. Rather than, why'd you leave the towel on the bed? Like, why didn't you feed the dog? You know the tone behind the why. You know what I'm saying. Don't act like you know. So I'm gonna give you a better way. Help me to understand how that towel always ends up on that bed. I do not understand how that towel always ends up on that bed. Amen. Help me to understand. Uh, Help me to understand, help me to understand how the clock on my iPhone always works and yours never does. I just don't, I don't know. Just saying, my phone works, yours Uh, Help me understand the reason you're behaving this way. You gotta lay down and get rid of those why questions, lay them aside, right? Put them away and pick up the help me understand. We, We have to learn, and this is important here, you'll see it in this text, we have to learn to ask questions seeking information. That is the heart in asking a question, isn't it? A lot of us, however, we don't ask questions seeking information. We ask questions accusing the person of guilt with our questions. All God's people said, we've gotten really, really good at this, especially in our culture. And I will say this to you, people do not respond well to the guilty until proven innocent line of questioning. So we have got to stop pinning people's ears back with why, why accusatory questions. And we've got to get on top of our tone and our assumptions and our questions in order to manage conflict well. So this unchecked pride leaked over into the way that the Ephraimites began to ask questions. And there was an inflammatory tone associated with their questioning. A third dynamic that initiated the conflict that led to carnage, 42,000 people being slaughtered in one day, was inflammatory threats. This one's pretty straightforward. Look at the end of verse one. The Ephraimites said to Jephthah, we're gonna burn your house over you with fire. Not a cool thing, right? (laughs) Like, we're gonna burn your house down and you're gonna be in it when we do it. I mean, chances are, if you threaten someone like that, probably not going to go well for you relationally. And the truth is this, incendiary language escalates everything. That's why the Proverbs were always like, listen, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Incendiary language escalates things quickly. Like our words can set our world on fire. Like go read James 3 this afternoon for homework. James says that an out of control tongue is set on fire by hell itself. I think a lot of the issues that we face personally and even nationally center on this one dynamic. We are a culture that relentlessly talks. Do you notice that? So we've been talking a lot, I've been hearing a lot, this, this, this whole idea of cancel culture, 
But we're not really canceling anybody out. Everybody's talking more than they ever have before. And it's just like relentless amounts of communication and conversation and the sharing of opinions. And the Proverbs writer says this, where there is an abundance of words, sin is not absent. How many of you know that one? Let me tell you what it means. The more you talk, the more propensity you have for sin. And so it's kind of like, help, I'm talking and I can't shut up. And so maybe some of us just need to shut her down and stop talking so much. You don't have to share your thoughts on everything. You don't have to share your opinions on everything. You don't have to weigh in on every single thing that happens politically in culture. We can all practice quietness and restraint. Amen? We can like calm it down. And I've thought about that. Like the more words I say, the probability goes up that the chances for me to sin are greater and greater and greater. And so that's why the Proverbs write, like, listen, you don't, you don't need to talk so much. And we know in this context here that a verbal threat to do bodily harm is completely unacceptable. It's inexcusable. It is absolutely criminal. And so making those kind of threats to another person is, I'm talking, completely out of bounds. A fourth dynamic that initiated the conflict that led to carnage, 42,000 Ephraimites being slaughtered in one day, was what I call an aversion, an aversion to the facts. So Jephthah's response to Ephraim's, why didn't you call us up when you went into battle? You didn't even reach out to us. Here's his response in verses two and three. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and I crossed over against the Ammonites and the Lord gave them into my hand. So Jephthah, I'll translate here, Jephthah says, I called y'all, but you didn't show up to help. Like I was like fighting for my life and you guys were like cowards. You were a complete no-show. And here's what I had to do. I had to take matters into my own hands. I had to just fight for my life because you didn't respond when I called you. As so I thought about it, I thought, listen, the fact that the men of a frame avoided this key fact that he did indeed reach out to them, he did try to bring them in to help, is actually quite telling. Like, like, do facts matter or do they not? Well, apparently it didn't matter to the men of a frame because the end of verse three says, why then have you come up to me to this day to fight against me? And so here's what you see based on verse three, that the men of a frame weren't interested in the truth. They weren't interested in the facts. They weren't even interested in a conversation with Jephthah. They were looking for a fight. And we'll just say this. They picked the wrong dude. They picked the wrong guy to cross on this day. In Judges chapter 8, they come hard at Gideon. Gideon's a different kind of a character. Gideon rolled over and, and mollified them, gave them their way. Jephthah, however, was that guy. You know what that guy? He's that guy. That's a guy you don't want to cross. A fifth dynamic that initiated the conflict that led to carnage was name-calling and character assassination. Look at the end of verse 4. The men of a frame called Jephthah and his men fugitives. It'd be like calling them uh, rogue warriors. It'd be like calling them you don't belong. It'd be like calling them a bunch of thugs. Now, obviously, assassinating someone's character is a really bad idea, especially when that person has a temperament like Jephthah. Remember, remember like Jephthah wasn't a fugitive. He was a judge and a leader that God used really powerfully. But ultimately, here's what you see. 
kind of all of these dynamics kind of stirred together and combined together, created a nuclear bomb-like response from Jephthah. So his men actually hunted people down, gave them like the linguistics test to determine where they were from or not from, to establish their identity. And if they weren't from Gilead, their lives were taken. And then at the end of the day, 42,000 Ephraimites fell at the hand of Jephthah and his men. You see it in verse six. So it's important to remember, and I want us to like, like keep our bearings here. It's important to remember the origin of this conflict. How did this all emerge and originate? Well, before the accusatory questioning, before the inflammatory threats, before the aversion to the facts, before the name calling and, and the character assassination, it was, it was the unchecked pride that led to their demise. And it's that unchecked pride that causes us to say things and do things that don't always represent who we actually are or what we actually believe. That's why this, this pride thing, we've got to be able to tamp it down. And so, and so what can we learn from all of this, like beyond the obvious, like, like regarding the questioning, like we don't make threats. What do we learn here? And how can we apply like all of these principles to our lives? Or more importantly, here's what I wanna do today. What are the values what are the values that the church can bring to the culture that actually helps stop all the hatred and the division and the conflict that we find in culture? So here's, what I, here's the way that I envision it. It is like the world is on fire. We are like, like literally pushing for, open to like a national divorce. We're being ripped apart at the seams. There are no shortages of conflicts that are creating that division. So we see all this mess, all this chaos, this huge fire. What do we do as the church? Do we just like sit back, stick our hands in our pockets and watch it burn? What can we do? Well, I think there are some values from this text that the church of Jesus Christ can, can bring to and or unleash in culture that will help culture. The first value the church can unleash in culture is this. It is, it is humility. The men, the men of Ephraim were so prideful, they only, they only cared about themselves, they only cared about their agenda, they only cared about their recognition, they only cared about their fame, and not the good of their, their country. This is one of the reasons why unchecked pride is so dangerous because it leads to everyone pulling in different directions. So it's this, it's here's what I want, here's what I want, here's what I want, here's what I think, here's what I think, here's what I think we should do, here's what I think is best. And all of a sudden you got millions of people pulling in millions of different directions and everybody just kind of wanting what they want when they want it instead of humbly asking, like, what is it that God wants? What might be good for everyone, not just me? And so the Ephraimites' unchecked pride actually created in them an allegiance to tribe and not nation. Do you think you see that happening and playing out in our culture today? Everybody's got a little tribe. I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Right, I'm a libertarian, I'm this, I'm this, and everybody's like doing what? They're running to their little tribe and they care only about what's happening in their little tribes. And they're not seeing what is good, overall good for the nation at large. And it kind of feels like the state of American politics right now. Allegiance to tribe only, not nation, certainly not Christ. It's like no one actually cares about anyone else except their tribe, their interests, their agendas, and their bottom lines. And that just kind of drives everybody. You gotta get what you can get, you gotta do your own thing, and we're not even thinking about the global good of others. That's why God's people need to pray for humility, and God's people need to walk humbly 
before God and before people. If not, if not, God will keep opposing our country and our communities. God opposes the proud. God opposes this unchecked pride. And so humility is a value that we understand in the church, and it is a value that we know that God honors and blesses. Amen? So we want to unleash that value into culture. The second value the church can unleash in culture is is verbal restraint. Like, Like from this chapter, you see just how much words matter. Uh, This text has given us a front row seat to see how nasty threats and name calling and character assassination can actually lead to unbelievable violence and and even death. So please understand, violent rhetoric precedes physical violence. This is a lesson our country needs to learn. Amen? The way we talk to one another. Man, we have got to calm it down and tamp it down. And so the church has to model verbal restraint in the way that we communicate, in the way that we respond. Proverbs 12, 6 says this, the words of the wicked kill, the speech of the upright saves. Proverbs 13, 3 says this, careful words make for a careful life. Careless talk may ruin everything. Proverbs 18, 6, I love this one. The words of a fool start fights. Do a favor and gag him. That's a good one, isn't it? The words of a fool start fights. Do him a favor, gag him. Like, stop all the talking. Proverbs 18, 7 says this. Fools are undone by their big mouths. Their souls are crushed by their words. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. Words kill Words give life. They're either either poison or fruit. You choose. Proverbs 21, 23 says this. Watch your words. Hold your tongue. You'll save yourself a lot of grief. And so I'm not saying don't talk. Don't, 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 never worth. I'm just saying that the church of Jesus Christ, we don't have to talk as much as everyone else. And that we can actually model to culture that we don't have to share our thoughts and ideas and opinions and recipes on everything that we see in culture. You don't have to tweet about every single thing. You don't. And neither do I. And so we have got to, even even when we, I see this all the time, we kind of get behind a computer and somehow like we get emboldened to say things that we would never say to people to their face. And listen, I've said this before, God can read your emails. (laughs) And let me give you something to think about. So every now and then, every now and then, I get some emails from people that my initial response is this. I just want to pound them. Like I just want to, in Jesus' name, beat somebody down. That's my initial response. So I got one from like a Vikings cheerleader, and I'm just like, oh, let me, I'm going to like lose my mind on her. And then let me tell you what keeps me, keeps me calm, keeps me calm. I envision me giving a response and her taking my response and sending it to the Star Tribune to out me in front of God and the whole wide world. And so I will say this, you and I have to be really, really careful with what we say, how we say it, when we're saying it. Just live like this. Live as if someone is recording everything you're saying and going to turn it into the Tribune tomorrow, or they're videoing everything you're doing and going to turn it into the Tribune tomorrow too. You and I have got to start thinking more long term and exercise some restraint rather than just like blurting and or responding to people. So I realized when I want to do that in an email, it's time for me not to respond. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do this. Delete. I'm out. 
I'm just out. Why? Because I don't want to say something that, number one, will be used against me later on. I don't want to say something that will hurt Grace Church, that will hurt our witness in this community. I don't want to say something that I will regret later on. Uh, here's a lesson. I'll say the name. We should learn a lesson from this man, John Grodin. That's a pretty heavy week for this guy. And all that he said, every single thing that you email, every single response, those things are essentially public knowledge for public consumption. And so, listen, we have got to, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have got to watch our words. We've got to hold our tongues. And in so doing, we save ourselves a lot of grief in Jesus' name. Amen? And so what do we do? The world's on fire. Let's unleash some humility into this place. The world's on fire. What do we do? We unleash some verbal restraint into our culture. And then the third value that the church can unleash in culture is that truth and facts matter. Truth and facts matter. Did you notice how the men of a frame completely discounted the facts? skipped right over the fact that Jephthah had indeed reached out to them for them to join in the battle. They conveniently left those facts out. Jephthah did call them, but they didn't show up to help. Ultimately, they didn't care about the facts. They didn't care about what was actually true. And there are a lot of people in society right now who don't care about the facts, who don't care about the truth, they just want what they want. This is why this whole theme in Judges, that everyone's doing what they think is right according to their own standard, is actually the pursuit of self-interest. It is not the pursuit of truth. I think we certainly see it in all kinds, from all kinds of media outlets. It's like facts and truth just kind of get in the way of the storyline. And so the church, the church needs to keep embracing the truth. The church needs to keep telling the truth. The church needs to keep valuing the truth, upholding the truth, submitting to the truth, and pointing people to the truth that Jesus Christ is our only legitimate hope. Amen? Amen? That's our role in culture. We spend our lives telling the truth and sharing the gospel truth of the world because it's the only thing that we have to offer the world that it doesn't already have. So what do we do? We unleash humility into culture. We unleash and we model verbal restraint into culture. And we do what? We unleash and we model the value of telling the truth and we point people to the truth who is a person named Jesus. So yeah, the world's on fire, but let's be a force for gospel good. Let's not just sit back and watch it burn. Let's not just sit back and wait for a national divorce to happen. Let's be the church. And let's tell the truth, uphold the truth, value the truth, point people to the truth, share the gospel truth with this world. Amen? So God, we thank you for your word. Help us today to be humble as a church. Help us to watch our words. Help us to be able to restrain our tongues. And help us to pursue the truth and to tell the truth. In Jesus' name, amen.